Arizona is home to 22 tribal nations and more than 340,000 Native Americans. Arizona State University builds on more than six decades of working and partnering with tribal nations and communities. Many of our Native faculty incorporate indigenous knowledge systems in seeking solutions through a process of community engagement that respects and honors traditional ways of thinking. Together, we are creating community solutions leading to a more equitable future. Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Delahungva. The Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria in California and the Point Reyes National Seashore are announcing a first of its kind partnership. It's uh, focusing on Native American culture and properties eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Tribal views and ecological knowledge will now be part of the management of Tool Elk and the ranching lands in the National Seashore. Tribal Chairman for the Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria, Greg Saris, talked about why the agreement is so important. When you're, you're partnering with the federal government, there's, and especially in the case of Grayton, where we do have some resources, it's an opportunity to do significant work in terms of uh, traditional ecological knowledge, restoring the land um, and the landscape, taking care of the elk that are there, the native animals. Um, it's, it's a win-win situation. Sarah says that while it is difficult to get into specifics, one of the things he would like to see next is the beginning of a restoration program. South Dakota's Department of Education is removing indigenous topics from social studies standards that are being drafted. Officials took out more than a dozen educational references on the Ochete Shakoe in curriculum for kindergarten to eighth grade lesson plans. Ochete Shakoe refers collectively to the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people who are indigenous to South Dakota and the surrounding states. The deputy secretary for the DOE says certain adjustments were made to provide greater clarity and focus. An earlier draft approved by the group work group, though, shows multiple grade level standards referring to the Ochete Shakoe Oyate compared to just three mentions in the draft released publicly 10 days later on August 6th. Native educators say non-Indigenous students gain a new perspective when they see things from another point of view. The Board of Education Standards is holding four public hearings on these proposed standards starting next month. The Canadian government is committing $321 million for programs to help Indigenous communities search burial sites. The, investigators, the investigation will be focused at former residential schools and funding will also go to, support of, to support survivors and their communities. A special facilitator will also be appointed to work with Indigenous communities and the government. They will pro propose changes to federal laws, policies and practices that are related to unmarked graves at residential schools. Canada currently does not have the necessary legal tools needed to deal with the issues presented by the findings of unmarked graves. Roseanne Archibald is the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. She says now is the time for accountability, action and healing. We had asked for a special rapporteur uh, to look at the guardianship structure um, and the authority to protect those sites, and more importantly, to support an investigation of these crime scenes uh, that involve our children, to document the investigations and to seek justice internationally. $107 million will also go to programs to support healing from intergenerational trauma. A Native Studies program in Canada is cashing in on a big donation spurred by a prominent Indigenous ally. Actor and writer Dan Levy, who is best known for starring in and co-creating the television show Schitt's Creek, celebrated his birthday on Monday. And to honor the actor, Levy's fans organized a fundraiser for the University of Alberta's Native Studies program. More than 400 people donated money, totaling $53,000. Levy took to social media to offer his thanks. Hi everybody, uh, today is my birthday and I would never normally brag about something like that, 
but um, a group of people on the internet raised over $50,000 for the Faculty of Native Studies on my behalf, and I felt absolutely compelled to come here and say thank you so much. Thank you for making my day. Thank you for doing such a good thing. Thanks to everybody who donated and the wonderful people who organized the, the fundraiser um, for my birthday. And I don't tend to celebrate my birthday, so um, thank you all so much. There is good on the internet. Who knew? Thanks. Last year, the actor enrolled in the school's online course about the history of indigenous people in Canada, and then he encouraged his fans to do the same. More than 50,000 people attended in the first week. The university says the new funding will support programs for students and research initiatives. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thelahungva. Up next, we look at ways of healing through the arts and medicine. Walter Lamar brings a new perspective on the Capitol insurrection hearings and reservation dogs. This is Indian Country Today. Graffiti is an eyesore, but in Eagle Butte, the youth are encouraged to spray. And they're taught some, by some of the country's greatest native artists at Red Can, an annual event for the Cheyenne River Youth Project, just one of the many programs happening in South Dakota. Julie Garrow, a founder and its executive director, joins us today. Cheyenne River Youth Project is a 33-year-old organization. We are a nonprofit on specifically serving the communities of Cheyenne River. And just over the course of 33 years, we've evolved to uh, offer so many, I think, creative and responsive uh, programs for our young people. You know, we began in this old bar called the Little Brown Jug back in 1988, uh, where we turned the dance floor into our activities area, our, you know, our little, where they stored the alcohol, we turned that into a library. So we did a, we lived there for 12 years. And then in 19, uh, 99, we opened our first youth center, new youth center for uh, four to 12 year olds. In 2006, we opened our second uh, teen center or our, new, our teen center for uh, 13 to 18 year olds. We have an organic garden. We now have an, uh, an art park, which is where we host our Red Can Graffiti Jam. We have an internship uh, program that's very strong, starting with 10 interns. Uh, now we've completed over by the end of the summer, I'm told that we will have over a thousand interns. We have a strong social enterprise component. We have a cafe and coffee shop online. We're offering a, uh, a food truck. Uh, and we just have a lot happening at the Shine River Youth Project. And in the end, it all falls under the umbrella of youth programming because I think one of the things that we are committed to doing is offering our young people options and opportunities and you know giving them ideas about what I can be and what am I interested in uh, about back in 2014 we really did put a um, we started really pushing to develop our arts program and we've always had an arts sort of you know component to our organization for the little kids for the teenagers but we just needed that arts is such a critical piece of, you know, uh, Lakota community of a youth program for kids, for expressing yourself for just such a multitude of reasons that, you know, it was just time to evolve that piece of, of our, um, our growth. So we, uh, I had encountered a graffiti artist and I was very intrigued by the whole idea because I think you think that you think about Lakota communities, you think about graffiti, they're all kind of controversial, right? So um, I thought the bringing of them together was kind of a beautiful thing. And, you know, in our community, you can't buy spray paint, the kids can't buy spray paint. So what we're doing is really uh, kind of goes against the grain, but uh, it's such a beautiful uh, medium for art. I, I was fascinated by it. The Youth Project is growing food and feeding families. We had Tokawi Garden, which is a plot of land that we have been growing food in since the mid 1970s. My mom, Ione Garrow, was the director of the elderly nutrition program. And she really felt that the one thing that we could do for that would help is if we could have community gardens or if people could have gardens. And I think that as a land-based tribe, one of the things that our young people really need to learn to understand is what that land can do for you. So the land can be, it could just feed you. It could be economic development. It could be tradition. Uh, it could be food security. There's so many things that uh, just a little plot of land can do 
for a family. And I really want our young people to understand that. So our garden now produces well over 10,000 pounds of food a year. Uh, the pandemic has changed it a little bit. Normally we have a farm stand, we sell it. Uh, we use the food in our cafe. So we do farm to table, we process it, we sell it in our gift shop. We do a lot of really great things with the food. Uh, primarily we feed the kids. We really want them to understand that where your food is coming from. And so this year, uh, for example, we had planted uh, sand cherries a few years back. So this year we grew them, they harvested them, we made jelly, we ate them. So knowing where your food come is, comes from is really critical. And I think we saw a lot of food insecurity during the pandemic. Thank you, Julie Garreau from Eagle Butte, South Dakota. On January 7, we invited Walter Lamar to talk about the Capitol insurrection that happened as lawmakers met to determine the outcome of the election. He's a security expert and a member of the Blackfeet tribe. We asked him back on the show to analyze the testimony at the House committee hearings. When I listened to that testimony, but what we have is, is we know the outcome of, of that day. What we don't know and, and what I'm hoping for is that this investigation will look deeper into what created the atmosphere, what, what created the, this to happen and the criminality, the potential criminality. And we saw the criminality of the, of the mob. We know what that looks like in great detail. What we're not as clear on is the criminality of those in positions that may have collaborated and conspired with these rioters to allow their entry into the Capitol, facilitate their entry. And, and likewise, we don't know exactly now, was, this, was it that criminal conspiracy and those types of crime, or was it simply performance and a, and a lack of performance from those that were tasked with protecting the Capitol? And also hearkening back to the seventh, I, I also said that I didn't believe that the rioters actually believed they would be in the Capitol that day. Um, and now in hindsight, I recognize that was wrong because they surely believed they were gonna be in the Capitol with the, 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 the bear spray, the mace, the tools that they brought, the equipment they brought. They clearly understood they were gonna have an opportunity to, to charge the Capitol and actually breach the Capitol security and get into the Capitol. When you have somebody in, in leadership that's standing out there and is actually wearing uh, um, a ballistic undergarment and inciting the crowd, I mean, it, it's 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 just it's just really hard to to um, understand that type of mentality. Thank you, Walter Lamar, a security expert from the Blackfeet Tribe. When we come back, we'll learn how a new medical school professor continues generations of healing. An Alaska native was named the inaugural Dr. Suzanne and Suzette LaFleche Professorship in Public Health at the University of Nebraska. Dr. Shaban Westcott tells us about the LaFleche sisters of the Omaha tribe. They are inspirational. Dr. Suzette was actually, or Dr. Susan was the first native physician in the U.S. of either gender. And at the time, there were only two medical schools where she could possibly be admitted. One was in the U.S. So she ended up going to medical school in Pennsylvania. It really is amazing to think in Victoria times that a woman dared to be a professional, especially at the level of physician, and that she was native. And then her sister, Suzette, was also um, quite famous and a strong advocate for her tribe, as well as a well-known figure in coordinating uh, a lot of good things for not only her tribe, but for rural Nebraska. So between the two of them, they were quite the power team. And I love that this professorship is named after them. Tell us about the role of traditional medicine in your work at the medical school. Certainly. And, you know, we have to be careful here. So there's Western medicine, for which I am trained at Harvard Med School. So I, I like to say I was belittled by the best. 
Uh, and then there's traditional medicine uh, that is of our tribes. And I, I really take inspiration from that because before contact, there was no Mayo Clinic that you could send your difficult cases to. We took care of each other. We survived and we thrived because we took care of each other. So that is the traditional approach that we're trying to get back to. And healing is the name of the program here at the University of Nebraska, where um, it stands for health, education, advocacy, leadership for indigenous and native generations. So we're not taking it in the moment, we're looking forward, but really, you know, you, you have to have all those. You have to have health, you have to have education, you have to have advocacy and definitely leadership. That's where um, I feel like, you know, this pandemic has really polarized uh, those leaders who make decisions that are relying on public health and, and help us contain the pandemic and those who take a more political expediency point of view uh, and are putting people's lives at risk. One thing we've learned from this pandemic and vaccinations is about the importance of tribal healthcare systems. That's our perspective. We look out for each other and we also have a tendency to uh, be good about vaccines. If pre-pandemic, the Indian Health Service had some of the highest rates of childhood vaccines uh, of any group or population or however you slice things up, the Indian Health Service did really well. And, and with the COVID vaccine, there was some initial pushback early on when it was at the trial phase, yet it still succeeded. And um, if you look at the data, and, and there's some problems with the data, we'll just put that aside for a second. And what we of what data we do have, American Indians, Alaska Natives are the most vaccinated race in the US, which is an incredible achievement. And it's gonna save lives, save generations to come. Indian country was hit very hard and early by the pandemic. So I think when there was this ray of hope with vaccines, that Indian country really em embraced that. And I, I encourage that. And I think you know it's worth taking a look at other vaccines that might be a little less um, emphasized and obviously we need to get through the pandemic, but certainly the influenza vaccine saves lives. Um, there's a Pneumovax, um, there's HPV vaccines. All of these um, are effective and safe and really can make a difference. Uh, they just don't get a lot of attention because you don't see people with the diseases if they work. Dr. Shaban Westcott at the University of Nebraska Medical School. Laughter is the best medicine and after a summer filled with promos and previews, Reservation Dogs is finally out on FX Hulu. The story centers on teens living in Oklahoma who want nothing more than to get out of town for the glamour of LA, but it's how they go about it that gives us a glimpse of reservation life that makes this show so unique. Taika Watiti and Sterling Harjo are the producers of this series that features native actors, native writers, and native directors. Last week, the stars came out in LA to premiere Reservation Dogs. Max Montour was there. We could be in California as soon as two months. California, here we come. It's so important to show in real res life. There's so many things that are so important to show in real life. You know, our people are so funny. Like, we have the, we probably have the most beautiful culture. So I think that indigenous representation as of for now is a big thing. Because growing up, you don't really, you don't see Native people on TV. This is the first show that's actually written by Natives and has an all-Native cast. So it gives us a chance to kind of do it ourselves, you know, and like show them how it really is, you know. I mean, it's really important because it humanizes us, shows that we're funny, that we're capable of humor, and I think that that's the most important thing, is just showing us as human beings. I think if, I, if there was a show like this around when I was young, it would just help me feel not so alone. I think it would help us as Native people feel seen, and I think feeling seen is very important. I think that it's healthy, um, and our communities and our kids need that. In today, 2021, it is very important for Indigenous people to have their own voice, have their own perspectives, and uh, be able to tell their own story in, in, without somebody else telling their story for them. I mean, I can see myself 
definitely going through some specific things that these kids are going through. And I've, I've, I've related to myself on those ends, you know. Um, I pulled from my own life from the character as well, you know. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't that hard to act. It was just really being me. And um, it was really awesome that the script kind of just fit its way into my, my real life. And it, so it wasn't really hard. It just, just did it, you know. You know, I keep going back to my mom, you know. It's like, uh, that's who I care about and who I want to see these stories. She grew up in uh, Fort Yates, North Dakota, in Standing Rock Reservation, and in Browning, Montana, Blackfeet Reservation. And you, you, it's never been portrayed on television. Uh, the day in the life of kids on the reservation and, the, and the, the, the issues that they go through, the problems, the triumphs they go through, the tribulations they go through. And what's most important is they get to see that native humor, you know, because it's a special kind of humor. It really is. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, all cultures have it, but all cultures are very specific in how they portray their humor. And native humor is, you know, very specific. And to, to bring that in, in out on television for the world to see, it's just beautiful, man, you know. We finally are getting representation, you know, in a, a different, um, we're in a different era where people are you know, taking chances and producing native content. I've been doing this for a long time, and it's just a beautiful thing to see. Important because there's so many misconceptions. You know what I mean? And, and exactly, that's the answer. So many misconceptions, so it's important to bring it up, what it's really like. Uh, my character's name is Daniel Johnson, right? and he's, uh, he's the fifth res dog. And I know you don't see any pictures of him on the billboards and whatnot, but uh, he's just as important as, you know, Alora. Cheese, Willie Jack, and Bear. Um, I feel like uh, Daniel's the one who really, really brought them together, really made them the Red Dog, made them them. Very important. It gives kids someone to look up to. You know, I mean, not every kid can be, you know, I don't know, a doctor dad. They can't, or a lawyer dad. They can't always look up to that. So it's, I don't know. It's... And Alora Dan is the kind of the brains behind the operation and is the one who organizes the, the petty crimes that they commit in order to raise funds uh, to leave and, and make it out here to California where we are tonight. <laughs> I think that, I think that indigenous representation in film and television is hugely important just so that we see our stories reflected back at us, that we see that our voices are important and that our experiences matter. I know that if I had watched this when I was a kid growing up in my community on my reservation, Gahnawage, up in Canada, that my, my whole outlook, my self-confidence, my self-worth would have been so drastically different than it was. So it's my hope that Reservation Dogs really empowers the youth from our communities and and also for youth from all marginalized communities as well. There's there's such a universality, especially with indigenous humor between our communities and I, I really believe that humor has been a coping mechanism for us to survive 500 years of colonization and is one of the main reasons why we're still alive and here and thriving today is because we we're able to, to shrug things off a little bit where we don't let it affect us too personally. Um, and I heard this thing where it's like, if you go into a native community and you're not being teased, then they don't like you. <laughs> I think it's awesome uh, to have this platform to shine light on native issues and to put it in a, in a comedic sense because laughter is good medicine and the world needs that right now. A lot of good medicine. So uh, I don't know what yeah, you think, think. I think they're gonna touch on a, a bunch of subjects that a lot of people are gonna be like, "Man, that's going down on the res," and it might inspire some people to, to actually want to help out more on the res than what the government is doing. And I think a lot of uh, other neighborhoods will relate with different issues that are re relatable. Same things are happening on the res, maybe even worse so. So Cheese is a character, you know, who's uh, he's like the little brother of the group, you know. He, he, he doesn't really have two. He doesn't really have that his own goals or anything. He just kind of falls along, does what he's told, and uh, he he just he might not understand everything 100 percent, but he's there to support it 100 percent of the way. Well, I think it's uh, it's pretty important because you know you get to see like kind of like a day in life, like a lot of a lot of people. Of course, not all people, uh, but. Uh, 
you know, just you know, seeing people like deal with like our characters deal with our own problems or come in like sit their own situations or like a more realistic take on how reservations are. They're not all like doom and gloom. It's just trying to catch that that real essence. I think Sterling and Harja really really capture that. Sterling and Taika. I mean, working with Taika was like super intimidating at first because like I've been such a fan and he's such a star. Um, but it was it was great. He's also just a community member first and foremost. And the same with Sterling Harjo, whose life this entire series is based off of. We all wanted to do Sterling right, and we all wanted to make sure that we we're representing the Muscogee Creek uh, and Seminole nations appropriately and respectfully and honestly. Um, of course, with that native humor thrown in there and. Uh, and I just feel really fortunate and honored and privileged to have been able to be a part of this project. Fight the man. It's hard to be a warrior with dignity. When the glass go pop, pop, pop. Bullets can't be stopped. That let them in shock. When the glass go pop, pop, pop. You better believe we shut down shop when the glass go pop, pop, pop. And that's a wrap from ICT. For more great stories, go to IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.